the ICC and actually go along with this, which it seems France and Norway and maybe even some of the other European powers are leaning towards doing, even if push comes to shove, it seems that the British government, you know, I mean, what's the point of being part of this court if you're not going to legitimate it, right? Um, and then, of course, the American government are basically just saying, like, yeah, this is outrageous. They're going, you know, they're they're just kind of dismissing this and saying the court has no power. And well, the think... Americans, the Americans aren't signatories to the ICC, so this is not their thing in a way. Yeah, so that they are not signatories to it. But you understand why this is important, right? They they either delegitimize that court and say it has no standing or they legitimize it and lean back into the myth that we were just talking about and the the idea of Nuremberg and um to me it seems that one way or the other something will change here because if they choose to delegitimize it it's very difficult then to go back to these show trials again you know they like you said Eugipius they want to put Putin in this court I mean, they, they they just lose that card forever. And retrospectively, it then, you know, gives you question marks over, well, hold on, what happened to Saddam Hussein then? Or what happened to Milosevic then? Or what happened to all of the other people who went on these trials? And even what happened at the Nuremberg trials? So you see, you see how that's, that there's a danger that way. But then if they legitimate, if they do legitimate it and lean back into it, then you've got the headache of well, how are you going to put Israel on trial? Or how you, like, what's going to you know? Can you can they actually put Netanyahu on trial? So, I think uh, from the perspective of the elite, it's a plot hole that has basically opened up in their story that's so big it's just threatening to swallow the entire story, and they're, they're not quite certain which way to pivot to get out of the plot hole that they've made. Yeah, I, I mean, it, the, the thing is, is that you can say, well, you know. I remember when it was just like South Africa and a couple of other nations, you know, and I, I remember I made a series of tweets back then. I was like, well, it's only Egypt. It's only uh, South Africa. It's only, you know, whoever else it was, Brazil or wh whoever. Um, but now it's like, well, okay, it's only France. It's only Norway. You understand like this, it gets to a point where it's like, well, hold on. You know, France is just not any old nation. It was, you know, one of the chief theatres of World War II. It has a permanent seat on the Security Council, um, you know, and is one of the major European powers historically uh, and in the history of liberalism and in American history. So, I mean, I guess a question is being asked, like, to what extent can America just basically piss away all its political, social, moral capital on its steadfast defence of this one nation in the Middle East? Can it do it? And if so, what happens then? Like, does that mean do we get a, we like you understand why it's important, right? That if it's losing its actual closest allies over this, um, you know, is it just going to stand alone? America and Israel versus the world or something? I don't know. Do the Americans care if they have to stand alone? Um, I mean, if they want to lead the world order, I'd suggest it's pretty important. Like we've lived in the American world order where it sets the kind of the tempo for what happens in the world. Um, if it basically turns around and says, well, actually, we're just uh, we're just like a, we're, we're completely rogue now. We just do what a, we just do what we want because we've got the biggest army. It loses all of that. It, it lo I mean, it, I mean, it, it can do it because it has the power, it has the power to do it. But the quick, but that is not how they've run the regime. They've run the regime as a kind of, um, you know, a moral superpower or, you know, all of this, all of these myths that we've been talking about. So any thoughts on this, Eugipius? Well, I have two. I think, first of all, there's during the Cold War uh, for a long time, the, of course, these principles applied. But I think a lot of, I don't have proof of this, but I suspect a lot of people in power had sort of a cynical understanding of, the broader propaganda system and the, the moral system that they propagated. And so they were careful not to use these tools in ways that could be self-discrediting or could undermine 
the regime more broadly uh, because they were engaged in the pragmatic fight against clear enemies. And more recently, I think we have a lot of true believers that we never really had before in power. It's perhaps a legacy of the unchallenged American hegemony period that started after the fall of the Berlin Wall and then lasted until sometime under Trump. So there's a whole generation, a little more, where nobody had to have pragmatic concerns and people were allowed to believe their own propaganda, get high on their own supply. And now these people are in government and they are making policy and so forth, and they start to apply these policies in real universal ways that they weren't really intended to ever be used. You know, they were used to discredit enemies. You're supposed to accuse Putin, but not Netanyahu, perhaps. And so that's changed, and it's sort of a new, a new thing somewhat interesting. I had a second point, but it's escaping me. Perhaps it's not very important. Uh, Dee, any any thoughts? Um, nothing, no, nothing really fine. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've, I've just heard so many of these. I, I mean, again, if one is old enough, one has heard this story in one form or the other. Um, certainly not directed against um, the, you know, the country we're talking about at the moment but uh, you know just just these this idea of someone you know facing international justice or being sanctioned or being you know indicted or this or that and so i've I, i've never sort of taken these things seriously uh i mean i understand that they can be sort of seriously value valuable as as kind of theater um for, for one cause or the other but you know again one one I, ju I just think the legitimacy is 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 a, is, is a problem. So I, I don't pay much attention to them. But but certainly, again, as a piece of as a piece of international theatre, it is um, this is this is probably a very different case than um, you know, the previous incarnations of uh, of this same uh, of this same act. Uh, yeah. Um... Do any, well, does well, anyone think anything? Point... Will, does anyone think anything will come of this? Though? I mean, is this Again, is th is this just sort of a formality, or do you, what, do, 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 what do you think that, that anyone would actually attempt to uh, follow up on this? Well, I think that certainly Netanyahu can't travel to Europe anymore. Uh, I don't know what happens to him after he loses power, is no longer in government. It could be a serious problem for him. So I think there are real, real consequences in in that kind of way. Uh, it's it also occurs to me that these these things they have been used in different ways before. So uh, Mr. Agent mentioned the trial against Milosevic and also uh, Saddam Hussein, and they were both defeated enemies, of course, and so they were a way to justify wars that we had already conducted. Putin is somewhat similar. He's not defeated, but of course we've poured billions into the Ukraine war, and it's a way to justify our own military actions. The Netanyahu uh, indictment or arrest warrant is a uh, fundamentally different in character. It is against a notional ally of the West, and uh, it feels very sort of new to me. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's certainly true. Um, and, you know, of course, like many other people, he will, he will probably end up, you know, with a luxury condominium in Florida or something like that. Probably where Zelensky will end up as well. I mean, assuming he makes it out. <laughs> I think something... Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think something does have to change after this, because they, like you were saying before, it's it's kind of breaking the narratives that they have in a way that they just can't work with them. And if they can't weave the narratives anymore, that's literally their job. Well, you, well, you see, I mean, without getting too esoteric, this has always been the problem when it comes yeah. to this particular group that we're talking about, which is that. <laughs> they have a moral particularism whereby they do not want to follow universal rules. Um, now you could say, well, there's a certain baseness to that, or there's a certain, you know, that's a kind of a good ethnocentric attitude to have. Um, but the reality of the matter is, is that if you have rules and laws that are meant to be based on the principle of equality, if you if you continually don't follow them, people are just going to start to notice. And I've noticed that it's causing. Um, I think it was Millennial Woes on a particular show has said that he has noticed that there is now 
visibly and observably a Jewish left and a Gentile left, and also a Jewish right and a Gentile right. Um, I spent earlier on reading a bust up that's happened in the Mises Institute, right? In the Mises Institute, mm. where Hans Hermann Hopper wrote an article eviscerating Walter Block, right? Now, okay, you could say, well, you know, libertarians argue all the time. But I mean, this is a this was a severe attack by Hopper on Block, basically denouncing him and saying that he should be uh, excommunicated from libertarian circles because he's no longer a libertarian and is now a collectivist, right? I mean, Walter Block was a, an original disciple of, uh, of of Rothbard and is 80 years old. He's been taken off the Mises site. This is like a major split that's happened uh, with, you know, people who've been friends and allies for years. Um, I've noticed it all over the place in many different in many different spheres, among the paleocons, among, you know, the soft left, the hard left, you know, the, the split is happening all over the place. And it always, always comes back to the same thing, which is that universal principles that you're meant to believe in, universal uh, ideologies that you're all meant to be signatories to are jettisoned because of the collectivist particularism, which is basically what Hopper's complaint boiled down to but we've seen this over and over again it happened in the soviet union for example uh famously um and uh it seems to be happening here again and i and i i, I do think that i mean even in american politics people are like people on you know who you'd think are hardcore allies are starting to, to kind of notice more and more hold on a second why are our senators signing these stupid things? There was there was this thing going around um, just the other day um, where even um, even one of these kind of like America firsters ended up saying, um, you know, why is it our leaders just can't do anything America first? And it was um, it was because it mentioned American Amer American people working for the IDF. And it was written into this uh, proposed bill that was meant to be going through Congress. That was the soldiers, wasn't it? That was the soldiers. Now, yeah. now consider, considering that America does not even have an official alliance with Israel, <laughs> it's kind of shocking that these things are, you know, being written into law. And, you know, people are rightly asking, well, hold on a second. These are our dollars. These are our, meant to be our leaders. Like, what have you done for us uh, recently? So, so, so I, I do think that the whole issue is uh, exacerbating a division that wasn't there this time last year. It just wasn't. And now it is. Um, so, uh, yeah, if they don't resolve it and they don't resolve it soon, it, it does actually threaten to cause a real issue for, for, for the regime all over the place. So... That's my that's my thought, uh, but I, I suspect that um, they will find a resolution some somehow. Um, the neatest one would be just to throw Netanyahu under the bus and to localize the quote unquote evil or the mistakes to him, and say, "Oh, it's not Israel that's the issue. It was just one bad egg, one bad man, Netanyahu." And that will be easy for the Democrats to sell on their side of things. And, you know, on the Republican side, they can just say, well, look at this transsexual or something, and they'll forget about it by next week. So that's... Have they not already tried the Jetson yet in your home before, though, and failed? They they have. But, well, there's this guy waiting in the wings called Gantz. I don't know if you've noticed. And um, he is the one, I think, that Biden has been trying to scheme in for a while. Um and he uh, made a statement earlier this week, uh, basically saying that he's going to resign. He's going to resign from the government if Netanyahu like doesn't change course or something like that. So that would be the neat. That would be the neatest thing to do. Would just be to, you know, because I mean, at the minute, America is basically throwing away a lot of its capital for the career of one man. 
and they can easily solve it if they just cut their losses on him, basically. And um, it would make it would they need a um, uh, how would you put it? Like they need a change of mood. They need to change the mood in the room. Uh, some narrative shift or something, um, and maybe that would do it. Maybe that would do it. So, yeah. Um, uh, all right. Yeah, G Gantz. That's his name. Gantz, not Gans. Gantz with a T. Um, all right. 